Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to uh, take a bit of a liberty and advertise or publicise something that we have going on at uh, our church in Oldfield Park. I know that many of you, particularly in your second and third years, uh, move into Oldfield Park. Um, on a Tuesday evening, uh, in our church building, we have a study cafe that uh, some of you may know about, others may not know about. Um, so if you would like to come and uh, be in a warm space, a comfortable space, if your homes are a bit cold and grotty, which I know uh, some student houses are, then you're very welcome to come and, uh, and, and make use of the church on that evening. We have Wi-Fi, we have tables set up so you can study. Uh, we have drinks and cakes and things like that to try and entice you in as well. But uh, you'd be very welcome to come along. If you want to pick up one of these, I've got a few flyers. That's on a Tuesday evening from 7 till 9.45. And uh, it's for anybody. You'll all be very welcome to come along and make use of that. I'll leave that now. So we're going to turn back uh, this evening to Luke 19. Um, I've read a story recently uh, about the owner of, uh, of a fitness club, a gym, a fitness club, a, a bodybuilding kind of centre. And uh, he was looking to drum up uh, some business. Uh, business was a bit slow, so he was trying to drum up a bit more business. And so he decided he was going to uh, set a challenge for the people who lived uh, in his uh, locality. And the challenge uh, he offered to people was that if they could come and prove that they were stronger than he was, and he was, a, he was built like a tank, he was an enormous uh, uh, sort of bodybuilder, if they could come and uh, prove that they were stronger than he was, then he would give them a thousand pounds. And his challenge was very simple. The challenge was that he was going to take a lemon and uh, he was going to take a glass and he was going to squeeze the lemon as hard as he could to get all of the juice out of it and then hand the wrinkled leftover, uh, leftovers of the lemon to the challenger to see if they could squeeze just one more drop of juice out of the, out of the lemon. So there were a few challenges that came along. There was a, uh, a few weightlifters, there were some construction workers, uh, there were some lumberjacks as well who came and they tried this challenge, but not one person could squeeze another drop of juice out of this lemon. And then one day a short skinny guy came in and uh, he said to the lady on the desk, I want to try this challenge. And uh, the staff just burst out laughing at this guy as he stood there, wanting to take on this challenge. But eventually when the laughter died down, they called the owner of the business and they uh, and he came into the reception and he got hold of a lemon from the, behind the desk and a glass and he squeezed the lemon with all of his might to get every last drop out of it. And then he handled, handed the wrinkled remains of this lemon uh, to this skinny little guy. And this skinny little guy got hold of the uh, wrinkled remains of this lemon and he squeezed as hard as he could and six drops of juice dropped into the glass. And everybody was amazed, dumbfounded, how had he managed to get extra juice out of the lemon? And uh, the owner was dumbfounded and he was a bit grudging about the fact that somebody had beaten him at his challenge. And so he went to the till and he got the thousand pounds out and he handed it over to the man. And he said to him, what do you do? What are you, a, a lumberjack, a, a weightlifter, uh, a construction worker, what, what do you do? And he said, no, no, none of that. He said, I'm a tax man. I work for the inland revenue. <laughs> Now maybe lots of you don't know anything much about the tax man just yet, but uh, what you will discover as you go on is that the tax man can squeeze just about every last bit of money he possibly can out of you. And you know, this evening we have read a story about a tax man, somebody who uh, really was uh, making money off the back of people, a man by the name uh, of Zacchaeus. You know, when we get to the end of his story, we discover that Zacchaeus uh, was a less than honest tax man. You know, at the very beginning of his story, it seems to me, really, that Zacchaeus is actually a, the kind of person that many 21st century Western people aspire to be like. You see, we're told two things about Zacchaeus in Luke 19, verse 2. The first thing we're told is that he was a chief tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. In other words, he was at the top of his game. He was at the top of his career. He was obviously an ambitious guy, and he'd made his way to uh, the top. It doesn't take much imagination, does it, to uh, picture Zacchaeus uh, at the University of Jericho doing his accountancy exams and uh, really shining as somebody who kind of stood out from the crowd, a guy who, who, who really knew how to deal with money, how to handle money. Having passed his accountancy degree, maybe he passed with flying colours, uh, and because of his success at university, maybe he was headhunted by the local Roman tax office as a suitable candidate to come and work uh, in their tax office. If he'd have been around today, no doubt he would have really shone in the, in, in the workplace. Uh, he'd have probably won an employee of the month 
uh, over and over again because he was so successful in business. He was lining the coffers of the local tax office. And what's more, you can imagine that this tax office that Zacchaeus worked for would have received recognition from their higher powers in Rome because they were doing so well, bringing so much money in. And it was all down to Zacchaeus, this successful businessman. And then you can imagine, I'm sure, that one day the, the tax office manager calls Zach in and says, Zach, you know, you're such a, you're such a success. Everything you touch seems to turn to gold. You just have that Midas touch, as it were. And so we want to promote you. We want to give you the top position. We want you to be top dog. And we want you to be at the top of your career because we can see that you're going to make things uh, successful for us. You know, I want to put it to you that many people would aspire to be like Zacchaeus. I'm guessing that perhaps many of you aspire to be very successful in business. I'm guessing that up and down the country in universities, there are lots of people studying, hoping that they're going to be really successful businessmen and businesswomen. So it seems to me that uh, Zacchaeus is somebody that many 21st century Westerners aspire to be. But then the second thing we're told about Zacchaeus is that he was wealthy. He wasn't just at the top of his game in terms of his career, but he was also at the top of his game in terms of his financial nous and his financial uh, wealth. He was loaded. There was nothing that he would have wanted that money couldn't have bought him. He could have bought the fine house, the, the swimming pool, the, the Bugatti Veyron of his day, which was probably a donkey with uh, go faster stripes or something like that <laughs> in, in first century Palestine. But you know, nothing that he wanted was denied to him because he was a wealthy man. His life was probably recession proof. We hear a lot about re the recession these days, don't we? Well, he was recession proof. He was probably planning to retire early, to live it up, and to have uh, a good time. And again, you know, isn't that what many Western 21st century people want? To be wealthy, to be financially loaded, to be financially secure. And so I put it to you then that Zacchaeus is just something a man like many of us aspire to be. Wealth, according to the wisdom of our world, is going to complete your life and make your life fulfilled and happy uh, and, and, and successful. So, you know, when we first meet Zacchaeus in this story, it seems to me that we're meeting a man who's not so dissimilar to us, a man who aspires to, to good things. But, you know, as the story goes on, you begin to get the sense, don't you, that things are not all that they seem to be for Zacchaeus. You see, we're told that Zacchaeus wants to see who Jesus is. You know, when I read that, part of the story, I think, well, why did Zacchaeus want to see Jesus? Zacchaeus had everything. He had everything this world could offer him. What could Jesus possibly give to Zacchaeus? Jesus was just a, a poor carpenter. What's more, Jesus had left the family business a long time ago to become a travelling preacher. He had no home, he had no wealth, he had no family around him. He had nothing that Zacchaeus could possibly have gained from. What's more, Jesus came from a backwater town called Nazareth. He didn't even come from anywhere important. He was a, a nobody in the eyes of so many people. What could Zacchaeus gain by seeing such a man, a man so utterly different from himself? You know, it seems to me that the very fact that Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus seems to me that things weren't all that they were cracked up to be for Zacchaeus. He had so much, and yet something was missing in his life. He's, in the, he's on the search for something, something that will give his life real meaning and real purpose, something that's just lacking at the moment. And you know, as the story progresses, as you get towards the end of the story, Jesus identifies what's missing in Zacchaeus' life. You see, Zacchaeus, Jesus says, is lost. Zacchaeus is lost for everything that he has in this world. He's lost. What does it mean to be lost? Well, to be lost means that you're not where you're meant to be. For something to be lost, it's not where it's meant to be. And Zacchaeus wasn't where he was meant to be. He was, he was lost. He was a lost soul. You know, as you read the story, you discover that Zacchaeus was lost in three ways. The first way he was lost is that he was lost socially. He was a socially lost person. You hardly need to be a genius to you to work that out. If you take a look at verse 7, 
Uh, when Jesus meets Zacchaeus and he calls Zacchaeus down from the tree and says to him, well, I'm going to come to your house. The people all gathering around, the whole crowd mutters to themselves and they say, Jesus has gone to be the guest of a sinner. A sinner. That's how people thought of Zacchaeus. Every person in the crowd looked at Zacchaeus and they said, he's a sinner. We wouldn't have anything to do with him. In other words, he's a social outcast. Nobody wants anything to do with Zacchaeus. He was lost socially. You know, every one of us are made for a relationship, aren't we? That's part of our human makeup. We're made for relationship. But Zacchaeus had no relationships. Because of his profession, because of the way he lived, he was lost socially. But secondly, he was lost emotionally. He was an emotionally lost person. How do I reach that? Conclusion. Well, the fact is that as a tax collect collector, Zacchaeus had become rich off the back of other people. Given what he says in verse 8 about giving back to people what he'd taken from him, he'd obviously taken more than he should have done. He'd obviously lied to his neighbours. He'd obviously deceived the people around him in order to line his own pockets. And you don't need me to tell you that to do that, you have to be emotionally lost. You can't deceive people, you can't treat people like that and not be emotionally lost, emotionally distant from people. But then thirdly, and this is the most important thing of all, not only was Zacchaeus socially lost, not only was he emotionally lost, but more importantly than anything, he was spiritually lost. He was a spiritually, spiritually lost soul. In fact, his social lostness and his emotional lostness are rooted in the fact that he was spiritually lost. He was not where he was meant to be, spiritually. Where is Zacchaeus? Where was he meant to be, spiritually? Well, Zacchaeus was meant spiritually to be where you and I are meant to be, spiritually. There was once a, a man who came up to Jesus. In Matthew 22, verse 37, And this man came up to Jesus and said, Teacher... Which is the most important commandment in the law? In other words, that man was saying to Jesus, Jesus, what will make my life what it should be? What's the most important thing? How can I know meaning and purpose for my life? And Jesus says this in Matthew 22, verse 37. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second command is a bit like that. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you want to be the person you're meant to be, spiritually, you need to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You need to love your neighbor as yourself. That's God's design. That was God's design for Zacchaeus. That's God's design for your life. That God comes first, and that other people come second, and that you come somewhere in there, but down at the bottom. You know, until we all understand that, until Zacchaeus understood that, he was a lost person. And until we understand that, we too are going to be lost people. It doesn't matter how successful you are. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. If you don't love God, and you don't love your neighbor like you love yourself, then you're a lost person. You may be a, a straight-A student. You may have your future planned out ahead of you. You may have great plans for wealth and health and happiness and all of these things, which in and of themselves are not necessarily wrong. But you know, if Jesus is not the centre, if God is not number one, and if others don't figure somewhere important in your thinking, then you're lost. You know, I want to say something to, to all of you this evening, and it's this. I don't want you to get this wrong. Actually, Every one of you are lost, are left to your own devices. I'm lost if I'm left to my own devices. I wouldn't want you to read this story and think, well, okay, there are some people who are lost. This person here and that person there and that person at the back there, they're lost. <coughs> if we're left to our own devices, every single one of us are lost. In the immortal words of Rizzle Kicks, just to show that I'm not totally out of touch, we're living in a lost generation, so there we go. I may be 41, but I still... No, a little bit about what's going on. We're, we're living in a lost generation. We're all lost, every single one of us. You see, not one of us could honestly say that we've loved God with all our heart, 
soul with your mind. And there's not a single one of us who could say, I've always loved my neighbor as I love myself. In Isaiah 53, verse 6, we read these words. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. No matter what things look like on the outside, we are all lost. We've all gone astray. So what is God's solution? Is there a solution to our lostness? Was there a solution to Zacchaeus' lostness? Well, the great news is, yes, there is. The answer to Zacchaeus' lostness was Jesus. Jesus is the answer to human lostness. Jesus is the answer to your lostness at this evening. It was Zacchaeus' encounter with Jesus. It was the fact that Zacchaeus invited Jesus into his home, that he met Jesus, that turned his life around, that stopped him from being lost and made sure that he was found. You know, Jesus in the Bible often calls himself the Son of Man. And right at the very end of this uh, story of Zacchaeus, Jesus says these words about himself. He says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. You know, the truth about Jesus is that he came into this world on a mission. He came on a mission. A few moments ago, I said that he was just a, a carpenter's son. That he came from Nazareth. But the truth is that his story goes way back before that. Jesus didn't just appear on this earth like you and I appear. Jesus existed from all time. Jesus was God in human form. His followers, those who spent most time with him over the three years that he was in ministry, <coughs> spent time with him. They, they listened to him. They looked at him. They watched what he did. They saw the amazing miracles he performed. And their conclusion was, this is no ordinary man. This is not just a carpenter's son. This is, this is God. This is God in, in a human form. They knew who Jesus was. And you know, Jesus came on a mission. He came on a mission to seek and to save lost people. You know, that mission culminated at the cross. The whole of his life, Jesus was working towards the cross. That's where he was going. He was going to the cross to save lost people like you and me. Remember a moment ago I quoted that verse from Isaiah 53 about all of us being lost. Well, that verse is part of a, of a wider group of verses about the cross of Jesus. And they say this about Jesus. He was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Jesus was the answer to Zacchaeus' lostness. And I want to say to you this evening that Jesus is the answer to your lostness. Just as I close, I want to just mention two things that Zacchaeus did that enabled him to be found by Jesus. Two steps that every one of us has to take if we want to be in that place of being found and not lost any longer. The first thing Zacchaeus does is he calls Jesus Lord. He confesses the lordship of Jesus. And you know, Zacchaeus was making an important step at that point by referring to Jesus as Lord. He was saying, from now on, I'm not going to live for myself. I'm going to live trusting in Jesus. I'm going to live trusting in what Jesus did at the cross to take away my sins. I'm going to live my life from this moment on following him. Romans 10 verse 9 says this, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, as Zacchaeus did. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. The second thing he does is he repents of his sin. He puts his sinful past behind him. He gives away his wealth. He sets the record straight with all those people that he sinned against and deceived. He leaves all of that behind. And he says, it's not going to be like that anymore. I'm turning and I'm going to go Jesus' way. Jesus has forgiven me. Now I'm going to live my life his way for his glory. I'm going to love God first. And I'm going to love my neighbour as I love myself. Friends, I want to say to you this evening that maybe you've never taken that step that Zacchaeus took. And maybe the Holy Spirit, if you feel this evening, actually I'm lost. And I need to be found. 
I want to be in that place where I'm right with God, where I'm right with Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit prodding <laughs> your life and saying, I want to do something about that lostness for you. I want to bring you into a relationship with the Lord Jesus. You know, tonight you can do that. You can do what Zacchaeus did. You can say to Jesus, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. Jesus, I want you to be number one. Jesus, I'm lost, but thank you that through the cross you found me. And Jesus, from this moment on, I'm going to turn from my sin. I'm going to live my life to please and to honour you. We're going to sing a song uh, just now, and I think the group are going to come forward to prepare to sing this song. It's a song that was uh, written by a man called John Newton, who some of you may well have heard of, John Newton. John Newton was a, a sailor uh, some years ago. And as a sailor, he was a typical kind of sailor. He was a, he was a gambler, he was a heavy drinker. His language was full of profanity and abuse. And he was involved in one of the worst trades that the world has ever seen. He was involved in the slave trade back in the 1700s. He was a horrible man. He, he said once about his days as a young man, I was an infidel. I was somebody who rejected Jesus Christ. I had no love for God. I had no love for my neighbour. You know, at the age of 23, John Newton began to read his Bible. And when he began to read his Bible, he encountered Jesus Christ. He read about the cross. He read about what Jesus did to save him at the cross. And at that point in his life, he knelt down and he said, Jesus, I'm lost. Please would you find me. Please would you save me. Please would you come into my life and help me to change. And he did. Jesus came into his life and at that moment John Newton changed. And over many years after that he fought against that slave trade that he'd been involved in. And after he'd come to faith in Christ he wrote this song, the song that we're about to sing. And these words are the words that Zacchaeus could have said as well. And I hope they're words that some of you can say this evening. I once was lost but now I'm found, I was blind, but now I see. Having met Jesus, John Newton was found. Having met Jesus, Zacchaeus was found. And this evening, if you were to meet Jesus, you would be found too. You would be saved from the lostness. Let's see this song.